like I, I give this particular talk in different settings, but um, it's so important because what's true about teenagers. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. You know, the typical American viewpoint of what a teenager is is so off base. And so, uh, just bringing some history, some what research says about cognitive development in these ages, in this age, to get a different perspective. Because how you work with your children is dependent on who they are, not, not dependent on um, the trends. Well, they all need cell phones. We don't take anything I say as something you shouldn't do, or they all need screen time, or they all need this, because everybody's doing Well, that's not the case. Not the case that we start with. Uh, what's actually going on inside of them? And I think that, that's really important. So I, I prepared a little um, PowerPoint, and I'll talk about it. And I stop anytime in between if you have questions or you'd like me to explain more. And then we'll save at least half of the time just for a QA. and a It'll probably be more valuable. All right, so biologically, uh, psychologically and emotionally, teens are unconsciously driven to discover who they are. I know they do wild things, but what's really driving them is, who am I? That's why they begin to not listen to you so much. I'm not gonna be just your child anymore. But that's the, that's the in, internal drive that's inside of them. What they can become. And first of all, and most importantly, how they can fit in their world. They want that so badly. That's why social media has had such a um, negative impact in many cases with children, because they, they just want to know, what's my position? So, you know, of course, social media does a lot of things that are not beneficial, um, but that's what they're hungry for. They want to know who they are in their world. Okay, so for this reason, this is important, because we've done this since the beginning of the school. Parents and teachers should seize this period of time. Not to think it's teen, when the teen years are over, thank God. I'll be so happy when this time is over. But instead, to seize this period of time, to inspire teenagers towards the best and the highest version of themselves. That's a lot of what we'll talk about. Um, and parents, mostly, but schools can have a big impact on this and where you're pointing them. All that energy that wants something about who I am and how to be with others, but our job is to point them in the right direction. So, nice picture of them dreaming about the highest things of life. During the teen years, there's a sudden spurt of neural capacity. This is what gives them all that energy, which supercharges adolescent cognition and their emotional system. That's why they just strike you as being wild. Um, and sort of have a reputation for that. The result is an infusion of energy into whatever captures the young person's attention. So this is the biological side. This is what's happening at the same time. Humanly, history has known this. These teen years are very important. That's when children are establishing who they want to be and what they want to be. But science has found it, there's a good reason for that, this period of time, developmentally. And, and the teen years can range, typically we're, you know, you would think 13 to 16, 13 to 18. <laughs> Um, this author that I'll introduce you to, Lawrence Steinberg, is a leading researcher in adolescents in the country. He says in the last maybe 20 years, it's gone down to age 11, and it's gone up to age 22 for various reasons, but it's broad. Um, but there is this energy when they hit a certain period of time that is related to um, uh, their emotional system, their, ad their, their cognition, um, and so I added here, this is why they can, be, they can go nuts. They make so many stupid mistakes and, and crazy ideas about what they can do. I, I, I had a boy about 15 years ago. He was just determined he was going to make the, uh, he was going to be a split end at St. Edwards at 5'4", 145 pounds. I wanted to tell him, don't, don't go to practice. Don't, please don't go. You're going to get killed. But they don't, you know, their minds are just, I can do anything. But that's, it's, it's not... Don't do that. No, that's where their minds are at. That's this infusion of energy. Um, and this, birth, this word you may want to hold on to, neuroplasticity. 
the, the time when the mind is shaped the most is age zero to three. That's the most. Hi, right, come on in. The second, uh, but the second greatest period of time in which the brain is being stretched, not just altered, it's stretched and it is molded through experience. There's tons of data that will support the position that by age 15, 80% of your habits and attitudes are shaped for the rest of your life. Now you, you know, you'll go to school and that'll be changed a little and maybe you get married and that'll change you a little bit. But basically who you're, who you're going to become is shaped in your teen years. That's what's called neuroplasticity. And aside from ages zero to three, the, this adolescence period is when it's happening most. So you can see right away, holy smokes, we, we gotta make something happen. This is when their minds are being molded, when their minds are being shaped. Um, and it's greatest during the teen years. So. I love this picture of first the molding. That's how um, we look when we're working with children, especially when they come in the first grade. I like that, we can shape them <laughs> again and again and again, how to look at life, how to think about life. Not, not just discipline, that's, that's, a, that's a part of it, but it's much more than that. You wanna lift their eyes to what where they can go with their life and how they can make a contribution to the world. Okay, so the best response to this phenomena is to provide teens with opportunities, with challenges, and experiences that will point them toward the highest plane of life. I think that's the picture she's going to go. So that's sort of the posture we take here, and with parents are the same way. I really don't care what other people say about teenagers or what they say about adolescents and all the trouble they get into. I just, just like this, this, and this. I know what's inside of them. Uh, I love working with middle school kids, especially the, the eighth graders. We have this Ben Franklin program, and the whole thing with the Ben Fran Franklin program is we watch movies, award-winning movies. And then we study, how, why did that person think of heading in this direction? Like we just finished Jackie Robinson uh, and, and breaking the color barrier in baseball. It was, we had such good discussions, and then we compared uh, Jackie Robinson to Annie Sullivan, who is the one who got uh, Helen Keller to be able to communicate with the world. And then we studied, what was the courage that he needed? How was his courage different than her courage? And what were the obstacles? So you, you get them to think about great things. Then what, what can you end up doing? It, it doesn't mean they're gonna set their direction. They're little children still. And you know maybe it'll be 25 or 30 before they know where they're going, but it, you put that in their heart, that aspiration to think that way about their life. Toward the highest planes of life, too. I, these are also the years, I have a great quote at the end from Aristotle, these are also years to talk to the children, whether they get it or not, how, how will you make the world better? Whether it is just your family, or whether it is your community, or whether it is your profession, how will you make it? They love to talk about these things. This is what people don't understand about teenagers. They love it. Now, as soon as the talk is over, they go in the hall, they screw around, they cause problems. You don't change them. You're planting seeds. You know? So right after you have a lecture like that or a talk with them, you know, we'll go out in the hallway and I have to go out and scold them because they're so loud they're disturbing all the other classes. So it's not like you're learning your tables of five. You memorize them and you have them. You're planting these seeds so believe it or not, teens hunger for guidance that will enable them to reach their highest potentials in achievement and in character. But once again, ignore what you see. This is what's inside of them. They want guidance. Many times I will tell parents, if, if teenagers have trouble, the problem isn't the teen. The problem is the parents. Because there hasn't been an, an environment that, and, I'll, and I'll talk about this, that works together with them to help them explore, well, what can I be? What can I do? How will I get there? Um, they're longing for that. So if our disciplinary m mode with our children goes from, you know why you're gonna do that? Because I'm your father, that's why. And that has to be, when they're little, you, you know, they, how many choices can they make about whether they wanna eat their vegetables or not? I don't care whether you like those vegetables, you're eating them. Or I don't care whether you like making your bed or not, you are going to make your bed. But as they get older and they want to determine who they are, 
to set up who they are, then you realize that's where we want to begin to guide them as their parents and as teachers. So teachers and parents should understand the powerful role they can and should play in a teenager's life. That's my main premise here, both for teachers and for parents. And what does that involve? If you understand your, your child's behavior, that's what they want. They want guidance about their life. They, they want to become a great person. We use that term, if you look up there in the back, great people doing great things. That's what we're learning to do. And we define great, not, not by necessarily accomplishing real high things or the things we typically think about great, but the, the nobility and a person of virtue and uh, stature, among others, that draw other, other people's respect. So we know that that goes on inside of them. So now you sit down with your little Joey or your little Sally, and two things have to go on before they just listen to you. Now it's a little bit finding out where they're at. What do they want? It doesn't mean you agree. Like, you know, Mom, I'm gonna be a tightrope walker. I've been really thinking about it, and you know, I, I saw a YouTube on this, and I, I think I can do it. That's what I want my life to be. And you're thinking, oh my God, are you crazy? Well, you may think it, but you don't want to quench it. <laughs> You'll steer it. Say, well, what's, what's the training for, to become a high tightrope walker? What do you have to do for that? You're creating a bond of, of conversation. You're still, you're still holding the, the steering wheel. You know, you're not going to go invest in a year's um, uh, experience in a carnival for your son or daughter. Um, but you're, you're respecting what they have to say and maybe even talking with them about it. A lot of times, what you and I can see, now I'm not saying your son or daughter can't be a tightrope walker, probably not, um, and, and, but you know all the reasons why. You're an adult, you're thoughtful, you have a background. You know, well, okay, some people may end up with that. It's like the boys who say, I'm gonna be a basketball player, professional basketball player. You think, oh, come on, you know, you're not tall enough, dad's not tall enough, it's not gonna happen. But they want, okay, well, all right, let's look at what it takes. How do you be, what do you need to do now to get ready for it? Well, let's go find, let's watch some a YouTube from LeBron James or, or uh, one of these other great athletes. And okay, so they get up about 5.30, you want me to get you up earlier? Well, well uh, not tomorrow. Okay, well, 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 we'll delay the NBA for a day. But the, so you, you end up with the same kind of conclusions. Um, but you're, you're teaching them how to think. How to think about what's going on in them. You know, they watched the last movie they watched inspired them to be a writer. The last movie they watched inspired them to be a poet. Oh, that's okay. The last movie they watched inspired them to be a mathematician. All those things are, are in the realm or if they're in your family, they probably want to be like dad or mom in some way or other. And so that has to be nurtured. But at the same time, we don't dump it all on them. We, we sit down with them. We build up from the time they're 11 on up this kind of conversational relationship. Still, you're in the driver's seat. And sometimes you just have to say, no, you're not going to spend a year with the carnival going through Europe. Sorry, you have to finish your education. But that it changes, and so we begin being their advocate. And this is where actually the bond gets tighter. It doesn't have to break in the teen years, where I can't stand my mom, I can't stand my dad, I'm gonna go try things. Well, they will try things, whether you're their advocate or not. But they understand, and this part is so important. It may not feel like it when they're 14 or 15. You remain the most important people in their lives. They want your approval more than anyone else's approval. Now I know they're gonna say, you know, this kid over here is doing this, mom, can't I do that? And you may say, well, do you need to or whatever? You still mean the most to them. And it is in this respect for the little journey that they're on, in this whatever it is, five to 10 years, to find out who they are, what they're gonna become, what's their place in the world. They know I can talk to mom about it. I can talk to dad about it and we'll talk through the whole thing. Now, I'm, I'm painting an extremely rosy picture. Um, I raised four kids, uh, um, and I've been working with children this age for almost 50 years. Um, they hunger for it. 
if somebody wants to listen to them, as crazy as their ideas may be, that you begin to create a bond. I can go back to this person and I can talk to them. And of course, most importantly, our parents. And so you become their partner, um, making decisions together. Now, as they get older, they'll make more of the decision when they're younger. The conversation, you, you are gonna need to steer it, but make them look at it the way you're looking at it. So when, when you know they have an idea and you're thinking, you know, I'm gonna be a poet, Dad. Okay, that sounds great. There's a many, many great poets. Now, are you aware of how many people can make a living by being a poet? Well, no, but the, I, I will. Okay, well, then there's just some statistics. I'm not telling you don't be a poet. I'm not against being a poet, but being a father, I'm thinking, you're probably not gonna make a living doing that, so maybe let's do that part-time. But they gotta come to that decision. And they gotta come to that reason, whatever, whatever line it is, so that they own it. But who helped them own it? Who respected them? It's you. And so you create this kind of communication bond, bonding. Now, if parents and teachers do not make the effort to continually influence teens in a positive direction, and I would say this is gonna cost you more time at a coffee shop or hot chocolate shop, uh, more time on walks in the woods with your son or daughter, uh, it, it takes time, a lot of time, and very, very personal time. Uh, teens will still seek meaning and direction, and they will receive it, but maybe not from a healthy source. So they want it. So by our taking the initiative, with the conversations, with having a deliberate time. When I was younger, I did more traveling when my children were real young, but I made it a point when I'm gonna be gone for a month at a time. Okay, when I come back, I have four kids, we're gonna, just you and I on Monday. And we spent all Monday together. They knew, even if dad's traveling and everything, when it comes to being together with them, they're, that's special. You don't write it off and, and give them to somebody else to a tutor or something like that. You spend the time with them. Because you know, my goodness, I, I do not envy any of you who are raising teens right now. Holy smokes. The things that they're just uh, uh, flooded with, uh, that you're battling against constantly. And so without the, without the sense of um, oversight and the sense of me needing to spend the time to communicate, then they will go in other directions. They're just being, because they want it, and they're just gonna find their own direction in that. So an interesting quote, Aristotle writes, youth are hopeful. Now this is before social media, obviously, 2,000 years before. Youth are hopeful. Their lives are filled with expectations. They're high-minded. They choose to do what is noble rather than what is expedient. And such then is the character of the young. Now that's how they observe them. And you know, I, um, you, you just look the whole world over, you know, who are the people that are usually fomenting um, revolution uh, or changes? It's young people, sometimes for bad, sometimes for good, but they're driven because they believe in high things and they want high things to occur. Sometimes, well many times, <laughs> a little misdirected, uh, but nevertheless, you see that power. I mean, if you ask me, you know, how about you get involved with politics and see if you can create a, a, a center party between the Democrats and the Republicans. I say, well, maybe my next life. Right now, no thank you. I go home after school and rest. That's about all I do. That's because that's old people. But young people, oh my goodness, their power is there. So you can see how you want to be being a partner with them to shape that. And then the last quote is that the traditional orientation of youth, regardless of cultural or philosophical orientation, is that of optimism. High hopes, a sense of awe and wonder in exploring their world and imagining what could be. And that's the kind of direction we want to be having uh, the conversations in as an advocate, as a partner, to set them in that direction. And I probably would add that it's a, it's a drip, drip, drip um, labor. My, one of my favorite stories about my second oldest daughter, um, she went to Hawkeye, and you know, you can imagine in our house, we're always talking about it. character, and this, that, and the other thing, character, 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 character. Um, so she goes to, comes home after a, a freshman, no, sophomore class in, in English, and she said, Dad, 
I, we're in English today. Our, our teacher talked about having goals in life. Dad, do you realize we have to have goals in life? My wife and I looked at each other. I wonder where she got that from. <laughs> well, you're, you're harping, 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 but you're, you're depositing is what you're doing. You're depositing something. In, you're depositing the way to look at the world, how you want it, want your children to look at the world. And the conversations impart that. Well, then when some, somebody else will say the same thing, light bulbs go on. Oh, I have to set goals in life. I gotta tell my mom and dad about this because maybe they don't know about this. It was hilarious. And my wife and I said, well, okay, that's just the way this game works. You don't get a whole lot of credit for what you did until maybe they're 40 or 50. Um, but it's that sewing through conversations over and over and over again. One other funny one, when I drove, we drove one of our daughters to school and she brought up something and, and I'm sure you're all like this. You know, right away I wanted to give her a lecture on this. And so I started and she said, Dad, stop. That's lecture 47. I know it by heart. <laughs> okay, all right, we'll, <laughs> we'll just go. It was another example of just this talking where you're, uh, whether they look at you and just say, oh, wow, that's great, Mom, or, oh, God, Mom, here we go again, which you'll get more of than the former, where they'll say, they listen to you. It's more like, you know, they already know it. Anyway, so that's the sort of perspective. That's a perspective we have here at school, very much so, um, with the middle school kids. So I'll pause, and then if we get some coffee or don't have them, we have time to Q&A if you like. Um, curious about the brain science. I don't, like I can read about brain science, but I can't really spit it back out in the same mm -hmm. way that I read it. It's not my background. <clears throat> but I, a lot of what you're saying is really parallel to some of the stuff that I've read, right? And um, the big thing is they're big risk takers yeah. because the, um, the, when information goes into the brain, it is 3,000 times faster that it goes it to the limbic it. system, right? And then, and then it hits the frontal, mm -hmm. the frontal lobe. So what I've been playing with my son about a year or so is uh, never trust your sense of urgency unless you're in danger. Um, and then when he's in that, you know, heightened yeah. emotional state, I'll just say, okay, that sounds great right now. Let's take a few breaths. Let's sleep on it. Um, and then I tell him, I explain this to him too about this process. So just slow down your decision making, mm -hmm. right? And so there was a situation where the boys get, got really crazy car accident, and I work for a clinical psychologist, so one of the boys ended up, you know, he, he had survivor guilt. So I tell my son these stories, you yeah, know, yeah. not to scare him, but I just said, you know, I wonder if before they all agree, if they waited mm -hmm. to make that decision until mm -hmm. that information got to go mm -hmm. up here. Mm -hmm. So I'm just trying to, to, to cultivate that, and yeah. I just practice, it's a practice for me, and so I just share that with him as often as I can. It's just a way, because the teenagers from the age right from 12 to 20 or 24, yes, mm -hmm. that's the biggest risk-taking mm -hmm. age group, right, that would take the risk to, to create a center line yeah. <laughs> in, yeah. in politics. They would have the energy, they would have the, um, the chutzpah, mm -hmm. they, you know, yeah. um, they, would, they would have the courage mm -hmm. and be more daring than any other age group. And mm -hmm. the only thing, like how, it's like, okay, that's great on one hand, but on the other hand, how can you keep them from going in a car with the kid who wants to speed? Yeah, like I wish there was a way to stop that. <laughs> yeah, it's just practicing. Mm -hmm. And I think that it was like a little group we were talking in, it was just like, well, what if we practiced teaching our kids? Like, this is the information. Um, just before you make that decision, you know, a decision, you know, wait. And I tell him, I'm like, go in the bathroom. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. So. But the stories are good. I think that's one of the best modes of teaching because you're not preaching at them. You're just telling them a story. Yeah. You know, we'll have children. One of the things we teach the older kids is um, somebody will misbehave and, and do something they shouldn't have done. But there were other three others there. And I have to tell them, if they did it, you're culpable also because you didn't stop it. 
And so therefore you didn't even mean anything, but you're in trouble. But that's, that's the fact. So um, I'll often tell them, tell them the story of we did have a graduate years ago who climbed into a car with three other kids and they were all smoking weed and they got pulled over. And the one nice kid who doesn't ever get into any trouble got in the wrong place at the wrong time and they ended up on a year of probation. So it's the story. I'm not telling them don't do this anymore, but it's the story is just like what you did. Yeah, like what if you waited? Powerful. What if you went to the bathroom, took a few deep breaths, waited for that information to get to right. arrive here, and then made the decision? Maybe it would have been different. Maybe not. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and you touch on a good point because as much as we will try, you know, some of them are going to really do some things they shouldn't have done. And you just don't think. But the whole picture doesn't change, and I think that's what's important: the advocacy and the partnership. Um, because of course you're extremely upset, and extremely mad, and they shame you, they shame the family, you know, whatever could have happened during that time. And then to be their advocate and partner again, you know, whether it's a small thing they did, or a big thing they did, because they probably couldn't even explain. You know, that's what you often say when they're that age. What were you thinking? Are you out of your mind? And you know, they said, well, I don't know. <laughs> they couldn't even give you the rationale, but they still went ahead and did it. And that is going to be a part of them being a team and, and emerging out of that faulty logic that they have. Again, this partnership, again, this advocacy with mom or dad that can you know, sort of redirect yet still supporting them as their, their advocate. Stories are, are great. Real stories in your life or um, stories that are in the newspaper, famous stories. There's a way that stories stick with people. They, they take something out of them. I have a question. Uh, we're talking about exploring the world, right? So they have so many interests that they want to try. Mm -hmm. So it's that fine line between being exploratory, but at the same time teaching them to stick with something and show dedication and they want to reach a goal. Even when it's hard, you still have to kind of plow through. So, um, I'm kind of struggling at this point where like, okay, when should I kind of let him explore whatever he wants to explore? Or where should I say, okay, you know what? You committed to it, let's stick with it. You will see, you know, maybe you're not good now and you feel deflated, mm -hmm. but if you stick with it, you'll get better and you'll be empowered. So um, I don't want to be at a point where I can like force him to do something, <coughs> but at the same time, I don't want to create, you know, for him create a habit where Okay, try a little yeah, bit, move little on, bit try a little hard, bit, move quit. on. Exactly. I don't want him to, when he sees something hard, to be a quitter, you know, to quit all the yeah. time. So, mm -hmm. it's like, when is it, you know, when to choose and you know what I mean? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't, there's probably not, I can only tell you stories of different uh, situations with that. I mean, there's some where um, there are certain things that you have to stick with whether you like it or not. You will do well in school at least with your core subjects, you're going to do well. But I don't like language arts. You're going to do well. I want you to go to your teacher and ask her, what is wrong with my writing? How can I improve it? Because there's the realm of responsibility. Sure. And in that realm, you can't say, I want to do something well, I don't. You have to do it. Then there's the, explore, the exploration, and there's two, two sides are, are, are like that as well. The things that the children want to do, they, it's just uh, exposing something they didn't have a chance to do. Versus, okay, if you're going to start piano, mommy and daddy have to pay X number of dollars every week for those piano lessons, so you will stick with it for one year, which means a half hour of piano practice every day um, until this year is over, then you can conclude. So a little bit it depends on the child and what it is that they are or, or do or do not need to stick with. But because even we, we distinguish like that as adults. There's some things I do. I, I love going to the Broadway musicals downtown, when I go, love going to plays, but that's it. It is purely for my enjoyment. I'm not gonna do anything more with it. I'm not gonna analyze the plot. I, mean, I just do it for enjoyment. But there's other things I do. I say, well, if I'm gonna do this, then I gotta do business, because it has to go somewhere. So in a way, you're kind of doing the same thing with them, uh, if you want to. I don't know what 
what it is that they're interested in. If you want to play soccer, see if you like it or not. All right, let's play for a season. But if they say, I want to join soccer and I want to get really good. Okay, let's talk about what it is to get good. Then uh, there's some coaches who will do tutoring. It'll cost us an extra 50 bucks, whatever, something like that. And then you talk them through it. Now, you want to make that commitment. We're not playing now. We're, we want to see, is this a field for me that I may want to explore? Um, then that changes everything, whatever they're going to learn through that process. So it's, it's kind of a non-answer, and most of the answers I gave you is from experience that I've had with different kids in different environments. Like that little boy I told you about, the football player. Mm -hmm. And so I, so I took him at his word, okay, let, let, I'll help you. So in the beginning of the year, I had the kids come up with goals in their eighth grade year. You know, we sit down and talk about them and work out plans, and, and usually they have no idea how to do this. But you, you brainstorm with them, okay, this is what you want to do. How are you gonna make the team? What do you need? Well, I just go out for it. No, that's not how you make the team. Have you talked to any of St. Ed's players? What do they do? No, I haven't. Okay, I'll give you a week. You know, some kids were at Birchwood. They went to uh, St. Ed's and they played football. What did they do to get ready? So a week later you find out, well, they get up every morning to lift weights or to run for a few miles. Okay, you wanna do that? That's the first step. And his stopped real early. He said, no, I don't wanna do any of that. Okay, then, then just go to the Browns game, enjoy. <laughs> Go to the Friday night uh, game. So helping them to discover at what level do you want to participate. Again, just coming back to an adult, we, we determine what levels we'd like to participate. I don't know if um, from getting in shape to, to picking up a sport, how much do you want to do that? So, and this goes back to the same thing, being a partner. You're really helping them to think about what they're doing and, to bring them onto the same process as if you were in their bodies thinking about it, how to think about it. So if you want to do some extracurricular, at what level? You just want to be exposed to it? Well, mommy and daddy have got to pay some money, so no, we're not going to do that. You can find some other way. If there's going to be a commitment, then I need a commitment from you. I don't know if that makes sense. And what do you think about them if they do think about what they're going to do? No, well, in a nice way, no mercy. <coughs> They're not going to learn it any other way. You know, this is there's a fascinating article in the Atlantic Monthly. If any of you get the Atlantic Monthly, um, because of the epidemic of anxiety, depression, suicides, all over the country with teens and primarily with girls, but boy, boys as well. And the conclusion, this is a journalist, but she's drawing on all the research. The the conclusion she makes is. Well, it's not that the world is worse and there's more things to wor worry about, climate change and all, all that kind of thing. The problem is, is the habit of moving obstacles out of children's way so they don't have to go through them. So instead of going through the obstacle, well, let's just move it out of the way. So, but I, I'm so tired at the end of practice. Honey, you decided you were gonna do it. Mommy and daddy are paying money to have this code. You are going to do it. That's what an adult does. That's what a mature person does. Now, if you wanna act, like a four-year-old, I'm not gonna let you choose something in the future. I'm rehearsing things I've told other kids before, as you can probably tell. Um, but that's the way you want them to be able to think. So that's what we tell ourselves, isn't it? When we've already decided to do something, and then it's Monday night practice, or whatever, whatever, oh God, oh my God, I don't wanna go. Pay for it, I committed to it, other people are counting on me, you do it. And children need to learn that and moving stuff out of the way so they don't have to go through that anguish, which is a part of growing, uh, really damages them. Then every time they come up against the next wall, there's a reason, and they, and they, they escape from it. They don't build up the, the, the grit to face things. We call it finishing it. Interesting. Finishing. Finish it. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. How can I support you? <coughs> like, and sometimes support looks yeah. like, man, that was really hard. Mm -hmm. See that you have a lot of angst about that. Do you want to take a you know walk the dog yeah. and come back and then revisit? You know, mm -hmm. it might be math or it might not be math, but like it might be you know just yeah. something. And so just finishing it and like you said, perseverance, right? Mm -hmm. So there's the standard. We set the standard, and um, part of the standard is you know hearing him when he's you know oinking and 
meeting him where he's at and holding him to the standard and finishing it. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah, got it. So maybe you won't <clears throat> sign up for it next year. <laughs> well, you know, I read you so many times on that when you, when you insist that they complete it, it feels good when you're done. Mm. If they haven't cut corners and they've done it really well, oh, they feel good. This history day thing that we do, if any of your kids have started that, um, that is so demanding, so demanding. I've had people as judges who are college professors say, I don't make my graduate students do that much work. Mm -hmm. But Connie Miller is just wonderful in guiding the children through that, and they struggle with it, and then they don't win. And it is amazing. As soon as it's over, they're already talking about what they're going to do next year. <laughs> the sense of accomplishment supersedes getting out of something. And it sounds like, you know, <clears throat> we're, little, we, we're new, you know, but it sounds like the standard is set. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's it. This is, this is what it is. This is how we do it. And here's the support yeah. also. Mm -hmm. And we'll finish it. And yeah. it's part of mm -hmm. it. That, that's like probably the best example. Like just the way I was raised. It's just he picked the topic and he's like, mom's not going to pick tanks. I'm like, you know, best, you know, you know, not if you want me involved, it's him and dad, and I'm like, mm. when I give him space or I ask questions, you yeah. know, I'll watch a video on it, call it free. But, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. Yeah. It's there. Oh, you, you point, you present a very good picture because it's both things. You know, I had such a <coughs> reputation of being stern and strict, and kids are scared to death that they get threatened to be sent to me. Um, but they also, also the kids appear, are very close to me because I will be very strict, minute one and minute two. Okay, so let's sit down. How about you and I figure this out? So it's a combination of the, you know, this advocacy and this partnership. Um, with me, you are not gonna cut any corners, period. At the same time, I will do whatever I need to do to help you reach the goal that we've already established. And so that, that kind of, of insistence on high standards and yet at the same time, not just leaving it. Oh, you're just lazy. You're not. A, you're not a good student. You don't want to work hard. No, you're lazy. You don't want to work hard. You keep cutting corners, and I'm going to help you stop. Be, start. Stop being like that. So it's just like you're describing. You put in the energy to help them do what they cannot do, and, and you're not just demanding of them. You mentioned in the beginning um, social media, and. I mean, my oldest is almost 13. I have younger ones, so I've had a chance to kind of, yeah, yeah navigate because over. of that, say, oh, no, I don't want to do that. So it's coming up. Words of wisdom. How do I go about it? Guidelines. Yeah, wow. I don't know. I, I do not envy parents who've got to deal with, with all that kind of thing. Yeah, it's very, very hard. In fact, I've heard one of the leading uh, psychologists in, in with adolescence, another one in addition to Lauren Steinberg. This is a great book, by the way, Age of Opportunity. <clears throat> He's the leading researcher. But I heard this fellow talk on a, uh, on a panel, and he said, I, I wish the schools would tell the kids in middle school, you cannot bring your, your uh, phone to school. He says, because when, if I tell my kid not to, it, it's just I created a different psychological problem. And that psychological problem is, you know, they're an outlier. You know, they're peculiar. Um, so here is a person who's an expert in the field. He doesn't know what to do <laughs> with it. And I think it's a, uh, it, it's a very much a family issue. Some families I know uh, will just say, well, that's fine. All the other families are, but I, we happen to be devil acts. And we know that's not good for us. So we're not going to do that. So it becomes a, uh, a, that little strategy I learned from my, my good Jewish friends. I've always been intrigued by how Jews have been able to maintain their culture for how many thousands of years in the midst of being so persecuted for what they are. Well, we're Jews and we're proud of it. And I thought, well, there's something to that. You know, not, not that we would become Jews, but that they would have, or like you're trying to insist on, we're not gonna lose our Greek roots. So there's something about, um, you know, it's, I know maybe it sounds a little arrogant, this is our family. And there's a lot of things that say social media is not good. So we'll do it, but only under these circumstances. You, first of all, you run the whole thing to what extent that you feel comfortable doing 
take social media. You know, and then there's some kids who use it and, and it's not, uh, doesn't affect them. I think more it does, you know, but it's kind of a, a how to navigate that and, and bring them on board. Uh, again, I would use the same thing, but what happens, honey, when you're on social media? What bad things happen, what good things happen? So they do it intelligently. Like, I, I can do social media anytime I want, so does my wife. I, we just thought it was a blessing to the whole world. Facebook, Twitter, my wife just thinks it's a blessing to the world. I've got 17 grandkids, she's in touch with them almost every day. Contacting them, they're back and forth. How wonderful is that? Now, of course, we know my wife's not gonna get hooked on <laughs> some negative thing on Facebook or something, but that shows that can be used for good things. And so, you know, if, if whether you decide they can use it or they cannot use it, you help them be intelligent about it and how they use it. Lots of kids, I, I like listening to the kids, uh, like in the seventh and eighth grade, and I'll say, boy, you are distracted today. I bet you were playing video games last night. And I'll say, no, my mom won't let me do anything. I get two hours on Saturday, that's all. And, oh, that's too bad. So I know what's going on. <laughs> you know, you would be the only person who restricted use of uh, screen time or anything like that. Yeah, don't believe them when they say it. everybody has a phone. Don't I believe I them. know. Don't I, believe I'm them. not, not saying for that. Don't have the <laughs> that's true. Think that they have. Especially not here. That's true. Mm -hmm. Just call the other parents. Cause they're fine. <laughs> <laughs> they're so, missing so where does the phone really come into place? Because obviously, up until they start driving, we drive them everywhere, and when we drop them off, they're always with an adult, hopefully. Mm -hmm. So that sense of urgency, where we want to make sure that they're safe. Really, it's not, you know, there's no, you know, something bad could happen, mm -hmm. whatever that might be. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, I have two, you know, my youngest is here, but my oldest is in a, you know, um, and he's almost 12, and the same thing. I mean, we went over the summer to somebody's, you know, vacation home, and the seven year old had a phone. And then I have my two kids, they're like, Where that how come? <laughs> how come? they're allowed to have phones and they're younger than us. And how come, you know, and I always, I say the same thing. I'm like, we spend time all the time with you. When we drop mm -hmm. you off, you were the teacher. If something happens, God forbid something happens, my teacher has a phone number and they can call me at any time. So mm -hmm. where's, what do you want to do? You know, but there's the TikTok and things like that. So, you know, we're approaching, you know, he's 12 now, so we're approaching that age where like the more, you know, people, more kids have it. So. I don't even know when to get him a phone because really there's no need for a phone, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so when is that, you know? There isn't. Time? There isn't. I got so I got four kids, and my oldest daughter, who's Cambodian, she's adopted. My my wife and I adopted a Cambodian girl way back in the 1970s. No screens. They all, now these are kids in high school. They have flip phones. She won't let them have anything else because all you can do with a flip phone is make a phone call. <laughs> but she's restricted it. And, and what I'm bringing up is that people, each of us is different as a parent. Well, we can, and our kids are different. So I'm not saying you do this. But, you know, that was their decision. Now, I have another, another daughter whose kids are just starting now to get into that. So how she navigates the insistence from everybody else does it. I'm an outcast. She's going to she's gonna have to navigate that her way. So a lot of it is, it sounds like you've already made you know, some preliminary decisions. What, what do you need it for? The only reason you need a phone is to call me so I can pick you up. So what else do you need it for? Well, I have to talk to my other friend. You got a phone, you know, a landline. They have like that. They have this. Yeah, they got other things like that. Where you can see what so you have your rationale, and I so, think that's important. Know, I think it's important not to still. give in to, the, to, the, to uh, what's happening. This is my family, these are my kids. I want to shape them the way I want to. And then you then you know you have general principles, like we covered some things today. Um, and with those general principles, then you 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 work with your your teenage son or daughter according to what you and your husband, okay, this this works for us. We feel we're protecting them, because that's a big part of it, protecting them from stuff. And so I don't want to say it's totally individual, but it's a, there's a great deal of individuality according to parents. You don't want to be influenced. Oh, but the other parents, they allow their kids to do it. Well, my comment on that, so what? 
they're not responsible for how your children turn out. So you don't want to be mimicking what some other people do. They're your children, and so you just pick up whatever you can about the best way to go at this and then apply it. Because you know the atmosphere in your, in your home, the culture in your home. And I think it depends on the family. So yeah. we got Cameron a phone only because we, we moved to the other side of town. Right, so then he has friends that, you know, we know their families and all the boys communicate on the cell phone with the texting. And so he was texting with his, you know, old friend on a, on a, a generation one iPad, <laughs> right? And he had to live with, like, he couldn't do the emojis, but that mm -hmm. was a way to keep him connected and mm -hmm. also have some yeah. guidelines. So he has a phone. It's never allowed to go in his room. Um, so like so before he got the phone it was just like well so and so has a phone because he's on a travel league and he can, his parents aren't always with him so that makes sense for them to mm -hmm. have a phone you're not in that situation yeah. so we're not going to do that but when we you know entered into a situation where we needed it um, and we were fighting it and fighting it we finally did it and um, it's very very limited like I, he has a game on it now and I'm like oh no. I'm sorry, like you play video games on the weekend. You don't need to have that on your phone. You're you know, you have a crick in your neck all the time. Like that's that's training your brain, like the dumbing down of America, I call it. I'm like, that's part of it. You don't need to be doing that. Like sit and read or oh, sit, uh, and, you know. You whatever. I'll so take a group of kids, twenty kids in the class, within five minutes I'll tell you which ones are gaming all the time. <laughs> it is so evident the power of gaming. And he gets forgetful. I could tell he's kind of he's yeah. had too much or he's not. So we just have our own reasons for it. And our, you know, I think it just depends on the family. And Very I much really so. like everything that you're saying. You know, it's like we just work together as a family in this way and you just keep repeating those stories and then when your circumstances change, the only opinion I have is I just keep it as restricted as I don't give an inch. I don't give mm -hmm. an inch until I'm probably, I, when I need to, I probably still wait. I, you know, so he has, it's really, he can't have it in his room. It gets charged by in his dad's area. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He uses it to play guitar, so we let him do that. But it's really the purpose of the phone. Like the purpose of the phone is connecting with his friends. So he's able to connect yeah. with them. So texting mm -hmm. and phone calls. Yeah. I, don't know if you I think making your decision for you, for yeah. your family, and how you want it to turn out. You know, um, so, so I have my youngest daughter, just a real quick background. She had a four-year-old, a three-year-old, and a one-and-a-half-year-old, and she got pregnant again. We thought, oh, good, a boy, three girls. She had identical triplet girls. Oh, my. <laughs> so she had six kids in a four year, within four years. She runs that place like a, like a, a training camp because <laughs> you have no choice now the kid now the youngest are eight um, so you can imagine six girls and and social media and all the things that that means and what they're seeing at school but again it's her family it's her kids they're gonna do what they've decided to do and then you then you support the children yeah. in that way so so that we don't have to give in to the trends that are, are going on I couldn't even imagine how she how she manages that. Well, I do because we go there at least twice a year. She comes up for all for the whole summer, so we can help. You can imagine the chaos. Mr. D, I hate to interrupt, but I know you have to be in the modular in four minutes. Oh yeah, okay, Two, a couple of minutes, yeah, then I'll walk. Okay, there's enough. That's a beautiful segue to my next question. Um, so I know it's very different for you. I have four kids, and I don't have six. Um, <laughs> So, and my question again with my oldest is, how much can I expect him to help with the siblings without putting him into a, I don't know, it's a big word, parentified situation. I, I don't want him to take over, yet I feel we're the, this is a family and you can help get your brother dressed so we all can make it to school on time and I can be here on time, for example. Um, yeah, any guidelines as a, you know, how much how much can I expect of him to help? Because again, we're—I always say—we're a team. Yeah. We, we have so to I would talk that out with him. <clears throat> you know, let's talk about how, how how you can help mom and dad get and all the kids get out. Um, 
and, and let him hear the whole picture of why he's important, why he's needed. Because this isn't something new. For a generation, as long as there's been families, people take up their responsibilities. Part of what I, I, I'm troubled with is children don't take their responsibility. Why can't you have a responsibility when you're six years old or when you're eight years old? There's life without responsibility is not life. That is a sure pathway to ruin if you don't have responsibilities. So there's no, it, 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 I mean, it's all about how, what you feel comfortable with, but sitting down and talking, why would I ask you to do it? How come I don't ask the next child to do it? You're the oldest, you're the most mature, you're the, gonna be the leader in our family, and that takes responsibility. Look what daddy has to do. Do you think he wants to do this and this and this? But he loves me, he loves all of you, so he does all kinds of things for us, for the whole family. I'm not saying do what I say, yeah. but it's, it's, it's different. Every kid is different in terms of their role in the, in, the, um, in the family. And for them to understand that and then to be expected to do that is healthy. One of the things we teach our, the, all the kids here when we, have a, we teach justice, but we don't teach it in a social you know, way like that. We talk about whatever environment you walk into, you've got to ask yourself, what am I supposed to be doing here? What is my conduct here? Am I a leader here? Am I a helper here? Even when they behavior, I, I seldom will, will scold children for talking, just to bl or blurting out. I'll talk to them. Okay, you're in a classroom. We're all learning. Everybody's listening to me. And what are you doing? Yeah, you're talking, screwing around. Okay, um, what should you be doing? What's the right thing to do? Right? Be quiet. When should you talk? You had a good joke, but when should you tell that joke? I go into the hallway. Good. We're on the same page. The kids can learn. They can learn just the same sorts of things that we do as adults, but we have to take the time to explain to them and um, then to insist. Yeah. Make him, a, make him a good big brother. Tell them when they're older, you want all the kids to say. What's, what's your oldest son's name? That's Surian. Surian. Surian Jane. Yeah. yeah, you say, well, all the kids are gonna grow up there. I wanna be like Zuri, and I wanna be like Zuri. He's my hero. Well, I don't care about anybody on TV. Zuri's my hero. Do you wanna be like that, Zuri? Mm -hmm. Or do you wanna be all the other ones who say, oh God, here comes Zuri, I don't want him to be around. That's what, you know, that can, children can understand that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have to, I have to go to a class. <laughs> yeah, thank you for coming. Thank you, thank you so much. Mm -hmm.